So I, uh, I work for a company called Cloudbees uh, that I helped start about uh, 18 months ago. Um, that's me on Twitter, that's me on GitHub. On GitHub it sort of gives away a lot of what I'm working on, which you can see I jump all over the place. Uh, currently I try to describe my job as trying to make things less reliable things more reliable than they really are. Uh, so what we do with Cloudbees is this whole uh, hosting of code, building testing of code, and then we host applications in a various infrastructure clouds around the world. So <coughs> some of the things I've used to get it done so far, uh, there's a lot of code in Scala at the back end, <coughs> and some web apps. Uh, there's a whole lot of Ruby uh, floating around. We've got a, uh, a chef, a uh, guy that's a contributor to chef, and a stack on stuff, uh, a couple of big Rails apps, Proxy Machine's a great little tool, uh, lots of little things like that. Obviously Java for the Jenkins build server, there was a talk on that by Cliff earlier this week. Uh, and plugins for that, and then what I'm going to cover uh, uh, mostly today is uh, what, what uh, we do with Erlang. So uh, the topic of this this talk is uh, about handling errors and exceptions, what a process is doing, and how it relates to post-traumatic stress disorder for being on call. So anyone who here is on call at times or has been on call? <laughs> yeah, so it's a small, small number, but it's, it's becoming developers and DevOps types to be on call. It's kind of new to me, and at, at PTSD is the best way to describe it. So part of that was uh, the assertion I'd like to make is that exception handling in higher level languages is a little bit messed up. So it seems kind of harmless. You start out with something like this in a Java-like language, just to try a catch block. Uh, we start get a little bit more complicated with uh, some types in it for uh, for Java or Scala down the bottom, where you've got, uh, you can decompose them and do pattern matching and all sorts of cool stuff like that. Here's some Ruby, the same idea again. I mean, this is starting to get a little bit hairier. So we've got a little bit of fictional code that does something, and then it does something really important. It does a rescue, a, a catch of one type of exception. That's fine. We can do it just later. It's a user error. Put something up on the screen. Send an email. Alert someone. Uh, we get another type of exception, but this one's a little bit harder. So we end up being in a nested. Uh, sort of uh, try, catch, begin, rescue, and what happens if it fails in there? Uh, it, it starts getting really confusing. There's the fiber error. Fiber really hurts if you don't have fiber. Um, <laughs> no memory error, that's my favorite one, and the equivalent in different runtimes. Uh, the stuff I've seen people do when they run out of memory, it's, it's, it's really futile. Uh, just give up. Um, and else, I, I don't even know why it lets you do that. Uh, and then ensure, or finally, as it's called in Java, that's just a lie. <laughs> so Erlang says no, no, no to that sort of way of dealing with uh, with exceptional flow. So uh, this is a bit of a rhetorical question. A process on the server is not responding. Uh, you've been alerted about it. You've got to deal with it. Do you A, panic? That's a great response. That's usually what I do. Uh, do you, number two, take the time to think about the underlying cause, ponder it, and then maybe have a bit of a discussion and form a consensus? Or do you just bounce it and pray? So uh, I'm sure most of the people do number three most of the time, and it works so well you often don't really spend time to think about doing a number two. That was a poo joke, so. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, so imagine a programming environment that you could spawn processes like operating system processes practically without limit. Uh, make concurrency someone else's problem by splitting things into lots of fine-grained processes. And don't try to handle errors if one of those processes gets into some error state, just let it die. Let some supervisor clean up the mess. So Erlang was kind of built this way. It was uh, built for stability and not bothering. And uh, to me, anything else is gravy. So I know a lot of the headline features of Erlang are around concurrency and all that sort of stuff, and, and that's great. But for me personally, the, the sort of the revelation for me was the uh, how, how to build reliable uh, fault tolerance systems with it. And I wasn't, and I still am not an Erlang programmer. I just describe myself as a programmer that does whatever I need to do to get the job done. But when I picked this up for real, I actually didn't really know Erlang at all. I sort of half read the book on a train once, so it wasn't that hard. If I can do it, anyone can. Can't be that hard. So some features of Erlang uh, uses process isolation. Um, you think of process isolation the same as you do with operating system isolation. It works pretty well there. You don't really share things between processes. And it's, it's just worked well for a long time. So each process in Erlang, for those that don't know, is, has similar semantics to an operating system process, but without the memory, without the weight. So who here went to the Erlang talk earlier in the week? 
a few people. Who, who's comfortable a little bit with the airline syndex? A couple of people, so that's all right. You can tune out and think about nice things if they start boring you. So uh, on, on the process model of Erlang, so the, the outer blue box is your operating system. You've got some other processes on the left, and then you've got this one uh, Erlang process that might look monolithic to the host OS, but inside that you have uh, something running called the supervisor, and then maybe thousands of processes running under control of that supervisor. Each process inside Erlang which is not an operating system process, but each Erlang process has its own heap and its own garbage collector, at least for the standard Erlang. Uh, so Erlang is a uh, virtual machine-based runtime, but a light one, so it's quite powerful, quite full-featured, but it doesn't generally doesn't make you pay a big memory penalty, unlike a lot of other ones. Uh, it actually comes from a, a prologue heritage. So uh, Joe Armstrong, when he first wrote it, uh, built the first version, I think, actually in prologue in the 80s, declared it as a success and it only ran 5,000 times slower than the system he was meant to replace. Uh, and that was in prologue. It was more to demonstrate the concept of a, a more declarative way of writing this sort of code. It has a compiler and an interpreter, so you can run it in uh, the, as an interpreter. It's got debug, debug tools, lots of batteries included, all that sort of stuff. And something called OTP, which I'll show a bit later on. So that's like a, a platform for building servers. So it's uh, not object-oriented. So this is my first sort of serious foray in, in many years into something that's not primarily object-oriented. Uh, it doesn't really have shared state uh, inside, between the processes rather. It uses something called term stores, like little mini in-memory or disk databases to share state when you do need to. Uh, because it's not object-oriented, it doesn't have that sort of sticky state, you can easily swap in hot swap code that's one of the key features of it. And it's kind of like functional programming. So I, I do a bit of functional programming, and that was actually the first way I learned to program. And I'll describe Erlang as, a, as functional programming influence. So it has immutable variables and higher, higher order functions, things like that. And you can also run it distributed. So when you talk to a process in Erlang, it doesn't make a huge amount of difference if it's running locally or remotely. So just a little bit of a dive into some uh, hello world type of syntax. So you write a function just by you know, writing uh, the name of the function, it's not, this is literally called function, it's a stupid name, I don't know why I thought of that. Uh, brackets, like anything else, the little arrow, and then variables are always uppercase. Uh, and then uh, statements end in a comma, and you close off the whole function uh, with a full stop. So, in that top example, I'm assigning x and y to two different values, and I'm trying to assign x, x to the value of y. So that's wrong, because uh, you can't reassign variables, they, they're only assigned once. It's actually a little bit more subtle than that. See, in Erlang, when you assign a variable, you're not so much assigning a variable, you're making an assertion, almost a statement of truth, that x is 1. And if x is unbound, then that actually succeeds and x becomes 1. It's actually a bit of a logic programming trick. So in the second one down the bottom, I do the same thing again, but I say x equals 1, and that actually succeeds, not because I've reassigned x, it's the assertion that x is 1 is still true. And that little uh, bit of text there, this is an atom. So in Erlang, anything that starts with lowercase is an atom. So an atom is just a, an intern string, if you like, a symbol. And uh, they generally just uh, conventional names that are passed around as arguments and functions and that sort of stuff. So that's uh, the first part of a little bit of the primer for Erlang. So going a little bit further, writing a, a, a slightly more complex function, we've got a tuples or tuples here, I'm just assigning two variables, capital N name, capital A age, to some literals, comma, and then assigning another thing to a, to a tuple, and then third line down, this is how I, one way of launching a, a sub-process, or launching a process, I pass in a little anonymous function, a little fun bracket arrow, that's an anonymous function, and then I put a bit of code and then end. And then the second one, the spawn link, that's basically the same as the first, except it keeps a link back to the process that spawned it, so it's like a parent-child thing in operating system process terms. And they even call it a kid, so a process ID gets returned when you spawn things, and, and you can do all sorts of things. But finally, this is actually a little bit more getting towards the real world. What people generally do is they use GenServer, which is part of OTP framework, and then tell it to start a link to a sub-process, so start a module. And the reason you do that is you can give that server a name. You tell it the module uh, that you want it to launch, some arguments to pass to it, 
and then some options might be uh, what to do when that subprocess fails, how to restart it, and all that sort of stuff. So I'll show that shortly. So a module could be as simple as this. So it's got the little module uh, private function call at the top, the dash module, um, and then the way you export things is you have an array of function names slash arity. So that's to a lot of people uh, when they first see Erlang, like, those little numbers floating around kind of look weird, but that's how you express a function in Erlang. Like, you tell it the arity. So this is exporting a function called start that takes no arguments, and then that's the function there. And you can see it's got module name, which is an atom, lowercase, colon, function name. That's really, that's really about it syntax-wise. So moving on to the OTP, uh, Open Telecoms platform. So it's not really about te telecommunications, which I'm sure people have heard before. It's actually, uh, I view it more as it's about network stacks and API, APIs and supervisor libraries. It's a toolkit for building servers, a toolkit for building middleware, if you like, and it also has a whole a lot of built-in uh, things called behaviors. So a behavior is a little bit like an interface, maybe in an in object-oriented-ish language. Uh, so you declare that you're going to observe some behavior, and all that means is that you need to export certain interfaces that that behavior defines. So that behavior requires an init function that takes an argument and a handle message that takes two arguments. So behavior callbacks might look something like this. So the init one takes an empty array. The arrays just use square brackets. Tuples use the braces. Uh, and then you've got these different handle methods. And it's common to see that in, in, a, in an OTP application. So handle is what gets called back when a message gets sent to your, to your module. So you've got things like call, cast. Uh, and they're just really different ways of passing a message depending on whether you expect a response or not. And then typically you have things like terminate, so that's a callback that happens that says, hey, this thing's about to die, or maybe even code change, because you, you can lie to swap code, and you might want to do something in that case. I, I've never found myself found much of a use for, for worrying about code changes. They just work. So here's a, a little uh, snippet of some, some real code. So this is a, one, one of the things I built that takes a whole lot of uh, a stream of statistic data from, from uh, from thousands of servers, uh, plumps it into a, um, a uh, sort of an in-memory table, and then sort of reasons over and does some just some basic statistic calculation and sees if it's in a window and does an average that sort of thing. So at the top, uh, what I'm doing here is I'm actually storing into something called a DETS. A uh, ETS stands for Erlang Term Store, and DETS is the disk version of that, so that's persistent. So when I write to that, it's going to write to a file. <coughs> And write those terms. So it's 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 really just storing these little Erlang structures that uh, you could almost think it's a little bit like storing JSON or something like that on a disk. The method down the bottom, I've got a few uh, case statements that are really simple sort of pattern matching in this case, uh, and that's you know that, that's a typical messy sort of example bit of code that that I deal with day to day. The functions I usually keep functions quite short. Uh, the current version of Erlang is the one I use when you when you get errors, when you get the equivalent of stack traces. It doesn't give you line numbers. It just tells you <coughs> the state of some things and then the, the arity of the, the function, the arity of what was called. So, And I complained about that when that first happened. And my Erlang mentor told me, well, that's teaching you to write your functions really small. It's not going to tell me which line it's on. It just says it failed somewhere in there. So, all right, refactor that into something smaller until I get functions of one line long. So <laughs> apparently that's changing, but I, I never know if they're serious or not about that. Yeah, they, they were talking about bringing it out to teams. Like, right, yeah. yeah. I, did, I saw the interview with that, but that was the same interview they were talking about how uh, they totally ripped off Scala for actors and everything. So I wasn't sure if it was a, it was a troll. So I, I, I didn't want to believe it. So. So I talked about the ETS, the term store stuff for Erlang, a little bit. So I've done a diagram to help understand it. There's, you've got the Erlang one process in the operating system with the supervisor and the processes running under that supervisor's control, sending and receiving stuff. And then you can have these ETS, these tables, if you like, which can be shared to every process in that. You can even have them locked to just one process. And then the debts is, is how you talk to how you talk to disk or one way of talking to disk. And there are database systems that are sort of built on those foundations you can use as well. So as I mentioned before, the, the processes are like operating system processes. They can only send messages to each other. 
They can fail independently of other. They can be restarted safely independently of other. And another side effect of this is it's actually pretty easy to write apps for. So say if you're writing a, a web app in Erlang, the model you would use, you wouldn't really think about whether you do a uh, you know async IO type thing like Node.js or a, or an all-threaded server. You just every t every time you need to do something, you spin up a process. A request comes in or a message comes in. You spin up a process. You don't care. There's really no practical limit to it. Uh, uh, you don't have to have any limit to it. So you just write your write your code as if it runs in a straight line. And if you're blocking on some external resource, don't worry about it. You just block and let the process just sit there. It's not going to stop it doing other work. So it's, it's quite easy to make uh, systems that would behave as if you were spinning up lots of little processes on your OS. One dies, you just restart it yourself. This is kind of how Erlang with APP makes you build apps in the first place. So they do tend to just run and run and run. So what's nicer than, uh, than using operating system uh, processes instead of using Erlang ones is they have tiny overheads, obviously. Uh, even less than, than, than threads in most popular languages. Uh, I think of, I, I've never used more than, more than a, a few thousand, but you can, uh, there are limits depending on how it's compiled of 50, 100, 200, 500,000. Um, it's light enough, uh, that you can use it for supervisory agents, which is actually what I use it for, running it on every box, because it's, why not? Uh, the side effect of, of being able to run lots of processes is that you can get lots of concurrency for free. Uh, and as I mentioned before, if you need to block, you block. So it's it's all uh, it's all pretty nice so far. So I've used Erlang for supervisory agents, so controllers running on boxes, uh, scaling services, so basically doing data analytics and stream processing. Uh, so that's collecting a lot of data. Um, Various backend web apps and systems like that, and even command line tools using the the uh, little e script tool it has, so you can basically write a, a script as if you would in any any language like uh, Python or Ruby or, or Perl, and just put a little hash bang at the top. And it's also pretty light. It's got a uh, a, a light footprint, as I mentioned before. So configuring these supervisors, uh, the trick here is to uh, Divide your app up into lots of little processes and set up the rules for how you want it to restart. So ideally, the system just runs, even as it encounters error conditions, it just runs without, without bugging you. So you declare your rules for restarting and what to do in the event of failure. Uh, the idea is you don't have to intervene. You can also hot reload changes uh, without stopping the VM. I, I don't often do that outside of development, um, not for any particular reason. It's more just familiarity. When, I, when we tend to roll out changes, we you know, install a new package and just run a command that restarts various services. But that even that's probably overkill. Uh, you can actually just have a reload change from this. And you can also have a, uh, a process if your application, if you've broken it up into several processes, you can have one process depending on another process running. So here's a, a bit of configuration code. So this is actually Erlang. So it, looks, it does get a little bit confusing with all the, uh, the, the brackets and things like that. So that little atom that says one for one is basically declaring restart just the broken process. So when a process dies, just restart that one in place. Don't take any other action. And there's some numbers for thresholds. And when they're exceeded, it, then, it's, then it sort of escalates. It'll, it'll end up doing a, you know what, what I call a panic and you know, annoy me. Uh, so that's the first program. So this, this module. Uh, that declared at the top actually has two, just two processes with one for one restart. So the first one is actually listening to a RabbitMQ message server. So I've declared some behavior and parameters for that. It basically just starts the start link method. And then I've got another process running alongside it, which is just a sync process. Uh, none of them are doing uh, uh, anything that strenuous, but I just want them to run all the time. They're permanent things. So if that one was to fail, or that one was to fail, then this policy would say restart that one, or restart that one. I can actually have different policies there. You could say one for all, so if any one process dies, the supervisor will then go and restart all of them. Uh, you might just want to clean slate. And you can also say, ha have the order of the matter. So if one, one of the process dies, then, then the one after it restarts as well. Uh, in this case, it was very simple, it's just one for one. 10 minutes, good. So anyway, that's why I use Erlang. Uh, some popular libraries and tools 
written in Erlang, grab it in queue, they'll talk about this by Steve earlier in the week. Uh, that's a great little message queue server, very reliable, very efficient. Uh, the React NoSQL distributed database, I haven't used that myself, but I do use Rabbit and Queue quite heavily. Uh, React looks great, I'd like to get involved with it one day. Um, it seems to be uh, getting good reviews in that. And CacheDB, which I have worked with, which is quite good as well, uh, also written in Erlang. Uh, CacheDB is interesting because they, they sort of write it as a big, there's versions of it uh, that, are, that are sort of big data sets. Uh, there's a company that supports that, I think. Uh, there's, there's couch base, there's couch base, and then there's cloud ant. So cloud ant actually have specialized in making it scale up to quite large data sets and distribute out. But the actual CouchDB project is actually looks smaller and how to scale it down so you can actually get CouchDB running on your iPhone. So they somehow made the, the, the runtime small enough to run on run on phones. So I thought that was quite interesting that they were able to scale both down and up with Erlang and of course probably the telephone exchange. Uh, runs it like or did at some point. So, some alternative approaches. Uh, people might like this sort of split things into processes, have a supervisor idea, but how do I do that? I don't want to learn Erlang. It does look strange. Um, well, you're probably already doing it with things like Upstart or Daemon Tools or Monod or things like that. You're effectively using the semantics of that where you, you're, you're running lots of processes and if they die, you try and restart and then eventually if it fails, you might alert someone. Uh, you're probably already doing that with native tools. Uh, there's libraries uh, like Hacker or Hacker for Scala that actually has the same idea and the same terminology, the same actor model as Erlang with it and, and supervisors. So you actually it has the same words like one for one and one for all, one for me. Uh, and that sort of uh, you know restart behavior and a supervisor concept. The limitation of things like that is being on the JVM and has one heap, one uh, you know one uh, garbage collector system. So if you leak memory in one of those actors and it's not garbage collected, then you, your overall process can still die. With with Erlang, um, each process has is cleaned up, has its own garbage collector, own heap. Uh, there's probably libraries for, for all sorts of languages to, to have this sort of approach. It's actually a pretty old idea. Um, and the general good practice of writing ephemeral or state-less apps, not state-free apps, but app applications that have less state and you can run more of them, you can start to stop. Uh, another approach uh, which might be worth trying is to write software without bugs. I've, I haven't tried that <laughs> myself. <laughs> but, uh, and finally, if you just restart everything 400 times a day, like uh, Billy Williams of Ruby on Rails requires, that also is. Yeah. <laughs> so, what what is not so awesome about the Erlang ecosystem? So, the OTP platform has a bit of boilerplate. I have a bit of a low tolerance for boilerplate. Um, there's sort of a little bit of ceremony in setting things up. Uh, I, I don't really know how to make it better myself. It's not too bad, but I always start with an existing app. That someone else has built, or that I built and clone it, and then work backwards from that. I guess over time I would get more familiar with it, but it still seems a bit distasteful for me. The virtual machine is not as fast as some other VMs, like the JVM, but it's quite light on memory. But it's 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 uh, more than adequate. Uh, no one seems to like the language. Uh, <laughs> myself, I, I actually used to work uh, for Red Hat on the drills project. And so I come from a bit of a logic programming background, and before that I went functional programming. Erlang seems to be a sweet spot for me, so I stumbled across it accidentally, and uh, seemed to really like it. Uh, but I understand why other people wouldn't wouldn't gel with it. OJ likes it. Yeah, OJ likes it. The only one. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it is starting to get popular though. Uh, tools, ideas. I, I I don't. I use uh, Emacs or Sublime Text, and make do with that in the command line. Um, it has its own profiling tools and debugging tools built in, so I just work out how to use those. So it might have less than other than, than other languages' environments. Uh, that's a fair point as well. Yeah, so uh, that's about it. So, so yeah, questions? We've got some time. What you mentioned about the OTP, um, why is that actually, actually from another point of view, because it gets all the team members on the same page? That's that's the explanation. That's yeah. So the, the the comment was that OTP gets everyone on the same page, that everyone understands the behaviour. That that is the explanation always given to me is that all these little callbacks and declarations you make are important and they do matter for your app. So you kind of need to understand how it works. My my objection is that I've written 
or involved with dozens of small Erlang OTP apps, and like to keep them small, or not actually that small. And each one, a lot of it is identical. Uh, so, but that might just be coincidence because it happens to be the same pattern type of app that, that, that I'm doing every time, and other, it might be different for other people. But yeah, but yeah, it, it is there for a reason. It's not it's not boilerplate in terms of pages of XML. They're just little yeah. lines of Erlang. But some of it to me seems a little bit. It's like oh, I have to look up what that's doing, or yeah. someone just told me yeah, to do yeah, that. Yeah. Sound and film. then also the, the you said that the VM is not fast enough. Yeah. Um, from another point of view, sure, like, like doing the JVM is good for sure. But this this system is, is built for like a, um, uh, what's the word? It's built for like real soft real time. Yeah, it's soft real time. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it's uh it's not fast enough. I'd say it's fast. It's not as fast, but yeah, it's uh yeah, it's it uh it might burst to the same speeds, but it, it's it's certainly faster than uh uh than, than a whole lot of tools you you might want to use. But it's more if uh, people are comparing it with with writing something like Arca with with the JVM. There is Erchang actually. There's a port of Erlang to the JVM, yeah, yeah. but it but it, it kind of uh, and it runs really fast apparently. So yeah. you can run. I believe you can run RabbitMQ on it and it screams, yeah. but then it and it and but it just like smashes into the wall at a thousand miles an hour because it has <laughs> no isolated heaps. It's all yeah, you know it leaks memory yeah, and it's, yeah, it's, yeah, there's yeah, a yeah. interesting combination yeah. between between using the soft real time where where you need it and then when you have particular jobs you just shove them onto Erchang. Yes. And yeah, there was actually a, a similar thing to that was uh, the Akka library actually has some interop with OTP, so you can actually pass messages in Erlang terms and they appear on the Erlang side as, as Erlang terms and then, then as a library equivalent on the Akka side, so you could actually, you can have them all join the same sort of grid if you like, and you could just send a message and, and then the, the Scala based Akka one does some, you know, big mathematical calculation that it's good at. And yeah. sends the result back to, to Erlang that's, that's doing the more critical, got to keep running stuff. Right. Yeah, I think Boundary's doing a good stuff around that, aren't they? Sorry? Boundary, coming in San Francisco, is doing a lot of network analytics. Yeah. We've got a few guys working on exactly what you're talking about, basically being able to share data between Erlang and other languages. Right. For computation and other. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But doing it by just collaboration rather than uh, you know, actually understanding the Erlang context internally. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But, uh, Sorry, yeah, the, yeah, with that, with behaving process, or suppose you have another process that sort of looks at them and decides whether they should be shot on it. So an Erlang process or an yeah. OS process? Okay, an Erlang process. Um, I'm not actually. I've never specifically thought about that. They haven't really been a problem. Um, what the only time I've had a problem was I was, I was writing that code that took a, a the statistic stream of data and I did it on a you know development pool of machines and then I it did some date calculations to work out how big the window is and I missed a few zeros here or there. It doesn't matter. But it went to production and it would run for a minute and crash. So it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it, it would run, but it just wasn't really doing what it was meant to do. It would just restart itself and tell us, hey, so someone said, hey, your code's leaking. So that's the only time I've, it's, I've never had it take down the whole Erlang VM. It seems like they're the sort of most problems are the ones not let the thing crash. It's like I'm using the at work. Right. They crash, it's okay. I mean, I haven't actually seen any, any memory leaks in that. Yeah. If they sort of hang, it's that that in, yeah yeah no I that's yeah that's that that halfway between the failure state. So uh, no, I haven't I haven't seen that in in Erlang processes. They're not they they're, they're definitely in something that, that spawns a bazillion threads and does all sorts of things and gets in weird states. And uh, I because we run a lot of JVM apps um, that we don't write. People will do things like catch the you know, all sorts of errors and and not handle them. So. So we just pass in some arguments. So if a certain error things happen, we force it to exit. So I'd rather the thing just die, and then then our agent will then go and restart it. So yeah. <laughs> so I haven't seen that behaviour in Erlang presses itself, but maybe it's because you just don't write them as big. So. Okay. Just a little comment on that. Uh, Erlang has some very nice built-in tracking. So if you've got a live system that's running and you think it's going to pass stuff like that, you can actually ask the system to tell you what messages is this process receiving. Yeah, and if you suspect it's bad, you can just kill it. 
Yeah. I mean, for, for the overall, for, for a given agent running out of box, we have a heartbeat that it's sending out, and when that heartbeat fails, we do an active test, and, and if that fails, someone might look at it, and most likely we just kill it and replace it with something else. So, it's a lot of active that has to prove that it's alive, and if it doesn't prove it, we assume that it's fine. Yeah. Um, so it's 12.30 now, um, so I should point out that lunch is outside. Um, I'm sure <laughs> That's very important to some of us. Um, I'm sure Michael's happy to answer more questions, otherwise, I might want to go out to lunch. Um.